Thanks for listening to another life-transforming message from the team here at C3 Southwest Washington. To find out more about our church, visit c3swwa.com. Come on, give the Lord a, a hand. You can remain standing with me. That was an incredibly, uh, that the first part of that, Leslie, that was incredibly powerful. Like, there's a moment even after you experience the promise where it feels like the promise is going to be taken away. And to have confidence through that moment that even though your promise looks like it's in jeopardy, that God's got it under control. How how amazing is that? I've got to go back and read that and visit that because, I mean, I was sitting there, I was like all of a sudden, oh, God, getting, getting my attention this morning. Let me uh, just help you to step into our message this morning, our Imperfect Christmas series. And I want to remind you that we've really sanitized the Christmas story. We have uh, sanitized the people. They're all clean and they're dressed well. Uh, Ikea Jesus baby in his Ikea manger, uh, his Oshkosh Bagosh outfit that he's wearing, the setting, you know, we've made the stable amazingly clean. It's been uh, desensitized, I don't know if that's a word, uh, oils being placed up into the air to make it smell beautiful. And the circumstances are epic. It's almost like they've selected this setting on Airbnb to have an experience that's amazing all doing selfies and taking candidates. But the truth is, uh, we've made it beautiful for our Christmas cards, but the real ap life application reduces this to a historical moment that we look at and we kind of idolize, but it has no direct correlation into the crazy life that we're living at this moment. I mean, we believe it from a historical uh, context and an overarching context over our lives. But we're challenged to see how this story impacts this crazy moment that maybe you're living in. So by re-looking at this story to see its imperfections, my goal is to see your faith encouraged and unlocked so that as you step through this season into the next seasons, you do so with faith and confidence, knowing God's got this moment in time. So today I want to talk to you along the idea of declaring your identity because one of the things at issue here in the birth of Jesus is his identity. And this impacts your identity and how you live it out. So let me pray for you. Father, I pray for each person in this room and at home. Father, we're so thankful for who you say we are in a world that's constantly trying to reassign our identity. And the thoughts that go through our minds because of what we've experienced, causing us to see ourselves in a different light than what you have spoken from heaven at the moment of our conception. And so I pray, Lord, that we would grab out the, the value of this story to be able to step into the true identity, who we are in Jesus' name, because Jesus was declared to be Jesus, the Savior of the earth, not by his parents, but by heaven. And so we pray over that in Jesus' name, and everyone said amen and amen. You may be seated, and if you're at home, you could be seated. Grab your notepad. Let's jump into this together. Let me bring you to a scripture that I skipped over. Matthew chapter 1, verse 20 through 21. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Amen. Uh, in our family, we're dealing with this idea of identity. Now, identity is the who and what a person is. Dave, if you'll take me to that next slide. The who and what a person is. That is what identity is, okay? And that is you. You are a who and a what. Now, Jesus had his identity declared from heaven at his birth, but you and I, we face naming our children and all sorts of things through the series of our life, okay? Now, you'll notice that on this, back, on, back on the previous screen, we've got a picture and a definition for identity, and I've listed out the Jason Bourne picture there. Um, in my family, uh, I want to explain where I got my name from. My, my grandfather's name was Michael Parrish, and he married a woman named Mary Hawes. Now, Mary Hawes became Mary Parrish, but when their firstborn son, or their firstborn son 
was born, uh, I'm sorry for the confusing words there, um, they named him Michael, but he was not a junior. His middle name was different. So he wasn't named after my grandfather. He was Michael Parrish with a different middle name. My dad being the second born in the family, they named him Stephen, but they gave him my grandmother's maiden name, which was Hawes. So my, grand, my dad is named Stephen Hawes Parrish. Now, when I was born, first born, they named me Stephen, but they didn't give me the middle name Hawes. They gave me the middle name of my grandfather, Michael. So I became Stephen Michael Parrish. As Rowena and I came together, and, and she's got a cool last name, it was Robles. And so I married up, and when I married Rowena, she kept her middle name, which is Jean. She added on the name Parrish. And as we began to have children, we were wondering what to call our kids. And honestly, we named Leslie just because we loved the name Leslie and Marie together, and it sounded good, not named after anyone in the family. She became Leslie Marie Parrish. And when Valerie was born, we liked the name Valerie, and we liked the name Nicole and them together. So she became Valerie Nicole Parrish. Uh, when Stephen was born, we, I didn't really give any input. There came the moment where Rowena announced, how about if we call him Stephen Michael Parrish Jr.? And I was actually shocked that she wanted to do that, but I said, cool, I've never had a junior before, so let's call him Stephen Michael Parrish. Now, as Stephen has gotten married, and he's married Mary, Mary became Mary Parrish, which was a little odd for my, my parents and my family, which was kind of cool. But as their firstborn son was named, I was excited to find out, what are they going to name? Come on, bring on Stephen III. And they ended up na naming him Eldon after his, I believe, his grandfather on his mother's side, James Parish, and we certainly weren't disappointed. We love Eldon. And then, but the second one came, I began to like cash in that dad chip, began to lean in and begin to say, have on Stephen. And it was so funny, Benjamin Levi Parrish. Okay. So he was born. Now they're having a baby, a third one on the way, which is exciting. And I was pushing for the Stephen Michael Parrish, the third, and we found out this is going to be a little girl. So I am pushing into the Stevie, maybe Michelle, like Stevie spelled as a girl's name, Michelle Parrish, and I, I continue to push for that. Now, if that doesn't happen on this one, I also know that they'll probably have seven more kids, and so the opportunity is absolutely still there. Now, with uh, the naming of people, you will have probably seen the movie, the Jason Bourne series, and we discover that Jason, his identity, the who and what he is, as he's coming to be the main character in the story, he discovers that he is not actually living his identity. He's not get living his, his uh, birth name. In fact, he discovers that his name, Jason Bourne, is actually an alias, along with Paul K., Gilbert DePento, Foma Kianov, Adam Stone, Nic Nicholas Lemonassier, his French alias, and John Michael Kane. His true identity was David Webb, but he only gets these flashes from time to time, and all throughout all of the series, he longs to become his true self, that David Webb. And that is the reality for everyone born into this world, because the reality is most of us are living in the midst of our aliases with flashes of our true identity. And one of the reasons Christ came is to help you to discover true identity so that you can actually enjoy all the benefits that come along with who he says you are, not the alias that you've stepped into. So I want to help you to grab a couple of principles here. Number one. Your parents, declare your, your parents declare your biology, but God declares your identity. And that's so important for you to understand that while I've named my son Stephen Michael Parrish, that is not the essence of his true identity. His name honestly doesn't mean that much because when we get to the book of Revelation, we discover as you and I overcome and step into heaven, God hands us a white stone with our true name written on it, a name that we haven't truly recognized. As God declared, his name will be Jesus. At your conception, God declared what your name would be. It encapsulates the totality of your identity, the who you are, what you were destined for. And the truth is, until heaven, you'll never truly discover it. But we're in the process of discovering it all along as we go. I love Psalm 139, and you could spend weeks in this chapter 
really discovering your identity. But let me read a little bit for you. In Psalm 139, verse 13, it says, For you formed me my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. This is so key. Your parents coming together determined some of your genetics. But God was there at the moment that you came into conception. He breathed supernaturally from heaven. You are not the process of a man and woman coming together, regardless of how, how excellent that arrangement was or how twisted that arrangement was. God was there at the moment of your conception. You've got to grab onto that. You are the creation of God. God breathed identity into you at that very moment. And that's a powerful thing. That's a thing that, God, that this world is trying to rob us of. We're trying to diminish our, our conception. Identity was breathed into every conceived child, whether they experienced uh, potentially a bad situation that they were born into or possibly birth defect or possibly abortion. That's, that's a key understanding that we have to have, that life is sacred because it's created by God from the moment of conception. Amen? And so... That's so key. It goes on to say, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That's identity. Some of, you, some of you listening would have a difficulty making that declaration. But the psalmist is declaring, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, I've gone through portions in my life where I've seen myself in a photo and thought, you are a complete loser. Stand up, put your shoulders back, quit slouching, quit putting your belly out. Why are you, you know, and, and I would observe myself as a less than. But someone who understands their identity understands that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That is the true identity of who you are. It is an exceptional human being designed for, on purpose for this lifetime. And yet the aliases push into us to see ourselves as broken, as less than, as inferior. And those aliases lead to a less than best experience. This is a powerful, you want to really de deal with issues of identity and confidence. Grab onto Psalm 139 and memorize it from heart and pray it out loud every day of your life. It will help you. He goes on to say, wonderful are your works. There would be a lot of people hard pressed to say, Wonderful are your works. You would struggle to declare, God, you've made me wonderfully. I am a wonderful creation. We see ourselves as leftovers. Back the bin shoes, not the designer shoes with a red sole. We see ourselves as less than. And we almost would feel guilty to declare the truth of God about our lives. We want to point out all of our imperfections. We want to declare our undoings, our worst moments in this lifetime. But it's so important for you to recognize and to declare what God says about you and to make sure that you declare it so that you hear it. You remind yourself of what God says about you and you remind your circumstance about what God says about you in those circumstances. Your less than perfect circumstances are meant to be impacted by your fearfully and wonderfully made life. Amen? Amen. I could read this farther. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret. Intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of these days, the days that were formed for me when there was yet as none of them to begin. Parents declare biology, but God declares identity. After all, God called the man Adam. And Adam means the first of mankind, the father of mankind. He gave him a name that declared his identity. And Adam walked in that identity, right? And we see that also in the life of Jesus. She will bear a son and you will call his name Jesus. Why? For he will save the people from their sins. Jesus stepped into this lifetime in his own identity. Let me give you a, the next point. Number two is that God declares your identity. That doesn't mean he composes your diary. That's so key to understand. I know the previous verse said that God has placed all of your days on the calendar, but he didn't force you to follow the script. You got to understand that. And this becomes important because there are things that God has placed you on this earth for 
that if you don't lean into, they will not happen. The, let me say this strong, because there are some people that struggle with this. Well, if it's meant to be, it will happen. There are a lot of things that were meant to be that have not happened. Why? Because we are placed on this earth to enforce heaven's will. If you want the will of God to happen into your life, you better first and foremost grab onto your identity. God declares identity. He doesn't pre-compose your diary, okay? Now, with that, let me take you to the next point. Wow, you're going through points fast today. This is, this is the 2021 version of Steve Parrish, okay? <laughs> Woo! Don't get too excited. We'll see what happens at the end. Number three, the enemy always attacks identi identity by trying to declare an attractive alias. And I am telling you, this happens in the womb. This happens after you're born. You are born carrying that identity. Your fingerprint is a part of that identity. But if you've ever watched any of the spy movies, there are recreated fingerprints that people put on their fingers so that they function in an alternate identity. And everything about your life, even from the moment that Jesus was born, there was an attack on his identity, on Adam. You watch it in the garden. What does the serpent do? Straight out of the gate, begins to attack the identity of Eve. Because if you can alter someone's identity, all the dominoes begin to fall in the wrong direction. It's less about sinning. It's about you questioning your identity. See, if you'll question your identity, sin will begin to look attractive. Like, this person won't love me unless I give them this thing I shouldn't give them. And so we begin to lean that way out of our identity and lean into an alias. Instead of being confident that God has, with our identity, provided all things, we begin to think, well, that'll never happen unless I sin. So it's a question of identity. In questioning the identity of Eve, Eve said, oh my gosh, I could be so much better than I am, than what God has told me, if we just take of this fruit and eat it. It's really not a, not a fruit issue. It's an identity issue. Her identity is chopped, attacked. She doesn't recognize it, and she buys into an alias, right? If you look at Jesus' life um, in the book of Matthew, Satan comes to Jesus while he's fasting. And in the process, two out of three of the temptations are focused on identity. If you really are the son of God, temptation number one, turn these stones into bread. If you really are the son of God, then do this other thing that's contrary to scripture. And I want you to think about your lowest moments really behind the decision to do something that was a less than decision, what was it about your identity that was struggling? I connected with them because I felt like, why would anyone else want me? I took that that didn't belong to me because deep down in, I, I was afraid that I'm not equal to the task to get what I need. I held this thing back from that person because on the inside, I, I was afraid if I put myself out on the line, I would be rejected. We struggle with this idea of identity, and it's attacked at the very beginning. You see it again at the beginning of Adam and Eve's life, their, their rule in the reign. You see it at the beginning of Jesus' life. I mean, what did, what did Caesar really try to do, what, or Herod try to do, attacking the identity of Jesus? A king will not be born in my land, right? And so you see that all along. Let me give you the next point. An alias, if you buy into it, limits access to all the best prepared for your identity. It's a powerful, powerful, powerful truth. Because as people come into our church, as people come into our world and into our lives, this is the number one thing that I see. I see the person who comes in and does not know their identity. I, don't, I also know that in not knowing their identity, they don't know the true identity of God. And so because they don't, they function in an altered state of identity or an alias. And like a different fingerprint, that 
alias will not give them access to all that's behind that locked door that God has for their life. And I'm talking about that includes talents and abilities. It includes uh, resources and relationships. And by not accessing with their true identity all that God has available, they're left using this alternate alias that op only opens the door to things that are far less than what God has prepared. And, and so when people walk into our lives, what happens to discover your true identity is to experience the true identity of God. I'm telling you what, when you see who God really is, it powerfully unlocks the vault. Who is the, uh, you got to know this, who has the vault been locked by? By God? No. The enemy is the one who's locked up your identity. The enemy would keep you from believing who God says you are. Why? Because if you ever believe who God really is, if you ever really believe who he says you are, you peel off that alias, you put your finger on it, that, that lock, and the enemy is, stands back and is, realizes you are about to step into your God-given identity. It's a powerful thing. I've watched this unlock in my life. I've watched it happen the moment I got saved. I mean, everything, my mindset began to shift. And repeatedly through my life, really the most transforming moments have not been that I stopped doing bad things. It's been I've started believing things that are true that then impact my access. Does that make sense? I mean, wouldn't you want your child to believe who God says they are? Man, it's a powerful moment. Not who the kid at school said your daughter was. Not what the, the loan administration said about you. You're not qualified for this loan. Or the job recruiter or whatever it is. Even the bad circumstance that happened. The kid goes up to swing the bat and he strikes out and people are laughing at him and walks away. Wouldn't you want your child to know, listen, that's not who you are. You are not who you are at your worst moment. You're not. But the enemy would definitely exploit that moment to cause you to function in an alias so that you no longer have access to all that God says you are and has for you. Because the truth is, if you won't step up with your identity and put your finger on that lock, it remains closed. We had a little boy that was on our baseball team when Steve was back playing baseball. And this, this kid would go up to the plate every single time. And he said, I'm going to strike out. I'm going to strike out. I'm going to strike out. And really, his expression of who he was and what he could do was impacting his experience. And I assure you, he struck out every single time. Now, this is a coordinated, talented kid. And this was like peewee baseball. I've seen people get a home run on a bunt. If you've been to any one of these, a home run on a bunt. And so I made a deal with a kid. From now on, you got to stop saying that. And this is what I want you to do. I want you to go up to the plate and say, I'm going to swing at every pitch. I'm going to swing at every pitch. I'm going to swing at every pitch. And sure enough, one or two times up to bat, as happens, eyes closed, a wild fan of the bat. He connected. And I don't remember if he got one hit, a base or two, but he came back saying, I can hit the ball. I can hit the ball. Yes, you can hit the ball. And guess what? His season began to turn around. He discovered an altered version of him that did not apply, which then radically impacted all of his steps forward. Now listen, you, uh, you've got to grab onto this. Because I'm afraid that you're missing out on your very best moments, that actually your alias is sabotaging the course of your life. When you say, my life sucks, I'm a horrible dad, I'm a less than best Christian. When you pray, dear God, if it be your will, help me somehow with the marriage that I'm destroying. In fact, I'll go a step further. Your prayer will reveal your true belief of your own identity. If you listen to yourself pray, it will reveal how you see God, and how you believe that God sees you. I shared this story recently. I asked a, one of our young men to pray out for himself, and I asked the question, is God first in your life? And he said to me, I think so. I hope so. I'm really, really trying. 
is a marvelous young man who has made God first in his life. And I thought it was amazing that he saw himself as failing in a situation that he's actually winning in. I saw the kid going up to the plate saying, I'm going to strike out. You're a home run hitter. How have you been convinced that you're second rate and that God is not pleased with you? And then I had him pray for himself and listening to, oh God, if, if you would be willing, if you would please, somehow, if you're not too busy for a little peon like me, he didn't say that, but I could hear that in his tone. Second class, not loved by God. Why should God take time to show me my next steps? I'm concerned that he is not the only person in my world who prays that way. And so you have to understand that allowing yourself to be boxed into a Jason Bourne or a Gilbert DiPiento or, or something less than your true identity keeps you from experiencing the very best things. Some people are actually praying, God, I pray that you would give me your very best things. God has already given you his very best things. It is up to you and I to lean into them, take them, not from God, from an enemy who would keep you from every good thing that God has for your life. If ever I felt that there was a message that you needed to hear, it's this. You are asking God for things that he has already sent his son to provide. God is saying, I've already given them to you. And the enemy has convinced you that they're not accessible. But if you will believe the word of God, if you will believe what God has said about you, if you will believe who he says you are, if you'll believe that what he says about you is true, man, there'll be something that changes. You walk up to that plate and you'll learn to swing knowing that he's for you. Let me give you the final point. It's important that you live your life declaring that identity. Because although your identity, you listen, your identity is going to be challenged every step of the way. Jesus experienced, we have the account of it in the garden three times. Two of the three times his identity was challenged. But that's just the account. You realize that even the writer, I think of the book of Luke at the very end said, if we were to write down all of the miraculous things that are about the Son of God, there would not be enough volumes in the world available to contain it all. We get snapshots of the life of Jesus just because his identity was only challenged this one time. Actually, there's a lot more times that his identity was challenged, but just the times we see his identity challenged, I can promise you it is a, I, I, I know it's a daily thing. You know why? Because it's a thing that I experience on a daily basis, especially in a season that we're all going through. Our identity is challenged. In fact, the enemy would then exploit that identity amongst other people. There will be some people that are at home for good reasons, and they're not here in this room for good reasons. But there are people in this room for good reasons. And distance doesn't always make the heart grow fonder. It actually ramps up insecurities. Oh, what he's saying is directed at me. He thinks I don't have faith. Or I, I must be a bad person because I'm not gathering. I mean, these are realities that all of us, I haven't seen that person in a long time. You know, it's like if, if you were the kid that went to camp and you met a girl and confessed your lifelong love for one another and he's promised to write, but she's a writer, but the guy's not. So he gets 72 letters in three days and he's doing all he can to compose just one, a couple of lines that don't sound totally moronic. And because she's not getting returned letters and because there's distance, the confidence, the identity of the relationship is challenged. And she begins to imagine, he must not like me. He must not want me. He must not have ever liked me. And so she fires off a final letter that says, I'm breaking up with you only to go to her mailbox that day, and finally he's confessed his undying love to her. It's because the identity will be challenged, and one of the ways to combat it is to declare it daily. If you were to abandon all of your prayer time as you've ever done it before, 
I don't recommend this for the rest of your life, but maybe for a season to allow your prayer time to be declarative. Remember, Jesus prayed this way. This was a prayer. Peace, be still. As he was standing in the wind and waves on a boat that was about to capsize, what was Jesus doing? He was declaring identity. This is who God is. This is who God has said I am. We are not sinking out in the middle of this lake. We are going to the other side. I declare peace be still. I'm going to tell you, if he didn't declare it, the story would have looked quite a bit different. But he knew his identity. He knew, he knew his name. He knew what God had called him to. He understood that in this setting, it's critical for me to declare who I am to a suggested alias. And if you would take the rest of your, maybe this week, to step into your prayer time to declare your identity. Stop asking God for this and that. I mean, there's probably some needs that need to be addressed, yes. But to spend time reaffirming to yourself, the declaration is valuable to you. We forget who we are. We pick up the passport and we see a different name, and so we function accordingly. But to get up first thing in the morning and declare things. To make the declaration of who God is, who he has said you are, what he's promised to do in your life, what he has said about your life, the promises that Leslie has mentioned, that we press into those things simply, if nothing less, to inform ourselves of who we are, of who God says we are. Amen? Amen. It would allow us to step into our day in remarkable ways. Stand with me. Let me read you this final verse. John chapter 18, verses 4 through 6. And this happens many, many, many times in Jesus' experience. So for those of you who might struggle with identity, I, I had a key moment. I was driving across a bridge in, 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 uh, from Longview, Washington to Kelso. This is maybe 20 years ago. And I was thinking about a circumstance that I was dealing with. And I was a youth pastor at the time, and I began to think about, wow, my, my dad lives... 3,000 miles away, and this is not really an area he could help me in. He's dealing with a problem. And I remember thinking about some of the kids in our youth group, teenagers, and their parents, and began thinking to myself, man, I wish, kind of wish I, I was them a little bit because they wouldn't be alone in this. They wouldn't have to solve this on their own. I'm here by myself. I wish my dad was able to help me because I knew that some of the parents of the kids in our youth group the parents would rush in and help out and finances and encouragement and resources. And I, I just have never felt more alone at that moment. I'm trying to lead a family. I've got three kids and I'm facing a circumstance where I'm about to lose everything. And I'll never forget coming across that bridge, which was the new bridge, but because it's Longview Kelso, it actually became the old new bridge because there's actually an old, old bridge in Longview Kelso. And as clear as day, coming across that bridge, driving in my lifted Ford Ranger, God spoke out of the heavens and said to me, you are my son. And I'll never forget that moment. I will help you. You are not less than, I'm your heavenly father, an earthly father. Steve could only do so much. I will help you. And I'm telling you what, invading that little cab of that cheesy little Ford Ranger, something got peeled away, some fingerprints, because that had been my excuse for a long time. I, I probably won't be able to accomplish this because I didn't grow up on the right side of the tracks. I didn't get to go to an expensive Bible college. I got stuck with the only option I had in ministry. I had so, many, so much of my life was wired that way. And God spoke to me and said, stop leaning into an alias. You are my son, my chosen son. You're so valuable. I sacrificed my son for you. Ah, ah. What's the value? Let me tell you, the value of a person is the ransom that someone is willing to pay. Heaven sacrificed its only son for me. That's who I am. That's who you are. You're not divorced. You are not on your second marriage. You are not unemployed. You are not the guy who lost a fortune. Your declaration is this. I'm a son. I'm a daughter of God. 
I'm highly favored. I am chosen. I am magnificently woven together with destiny. I am in the right place at the right time. I have buried within me all things necessary to fulfill all that God has. Come on, some of you need to start praying out right here and right now over yourself. I am becoming a fantastic father. I will be an excellent husband. Come on, pray out loud over your own particular life. Declare the truth over your circumstance. At home, declare over yourself. This is who I am. I declare to myself. I declare to my circumstances. This is who I am. I am a man of God. I am forgiven. I step into today strong. I am more than a conqueror. I am an overcomer. I am the recipient of promises that will be fulfilled. I will raise a generation that will raise a generation. I am an excellent parent. I am an excellent husband. And in my imperfections, I am submitted to the perfecting hand of God. And in the process, our God will perfect me and he is not limited by my imperfections. He is able to do above and beyond all that you or I could ever see. God, I am your son. I am your daughter. Come on, declare that over your own life. I am a child of God. Hallelujah. Let me just say this. Add this into the mix. You will never discover your identity until you say yes to the one who assigned your identity. And his son's name is Jesus. Whether you're in this room or you're somewhere else, if for the very first time or you've strayed or you've wandered, I want to invite you into identity by saying yes to the one who is the truth, Jesus. The relationship with Jesus unlocks all of this. And it could be that in this season, listen, it's easy to wander in this season, to get caught up in all the narratives that are out there, to stray away from close embrace of the one who has the future in his hands, your future. Your diary hasn't been written out, but your steps are when you submit your steps to him. You'll fulfill all the promises. They'll all be experienced. I want you to pray with me. Jesus, I surrender. Pray it out loud. Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Come on, say it with me. Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Say this. I give you my life. You knew who you were. And you came so that I would know who I am. Give me a revelation as I give my life to you that all my days will fulfill your purposes spoken over me in the moment I was conceived. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Give the Lord a big, 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 big hand. Thanks for listening. To find out more about our pastors, leaders, and what we do at C3 Church, visit our website at c3swwa.com.